turn with me to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. And uh, I believe, uh, yeah, we have a scripture on the screen as well. But uh, I always think it's good if you have your Bible there to just practice turning to it. You're not always going to have a PowerPoint in front of you when you want to find a scripture. So, so it's always good to keep in practice of... Uh, Turning a Bible to a scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 14 through 16. Uh, Peter the apostle is speaking to the persecuted church scattered um, because of their faith in Christ. And he's encouraging them to keep their hope in Christ and that God's working through their tribulation. And he reminds them that Jesus is coming back again and in hope of eternity. This is what he says then starting with verse 14. As obedient children, may I remind you, you are a child of God if you're a Christian today. You belong to Him. God has adopted you into His family, and as His child, we are to be obedient. And so as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. In other words, don't live the way you used to live before you knew Jesus. Don't live that way. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Be holy in all you do. We are currently in a series of messages I'm entitled, Words That Matter. Common or, or words found in Scripture that have kind of fallen by the wayside in our modern world. And we looked at the word saved, how that's how the Bible describes what it means to become a Christian. We are saved, we experience salvation. We looked at the word sin, what that meant. We looked last week at the word repentance. And this week we're going to look at the word holy or holiness. It's a word that has fallen by the wayside, unfortunately, in many Christian circles. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to bring out to you how important it is, what holiness is, and how important it is. But let me start with this. In the forests of northern Europe and Asia, there lives an interesting little creature called the ermine. Now the ermine is known for its snow-white fur in the wintertime. And what makes this creature so interesting is that it instinctively protects its fur coat from anything that would soil. It doesn't like to get dirty. Now, hunters take advantage of this unusual trait because in order to track or to capture the ermine, they don't set up traps like they would for uh, animals normally that size. Instead, what they do is they find where the ermine is holding up at it, whether a hollow log, perhaps a, a, a crevice in the rock. And what they'll do is they'll desecrate the opening. They'll just put dirt, whatever, all around it, make it really dirty, knowing that the ermine will not go in with all that dirt. And then they set the dogs loose on the poor animal, and the animal will run to its, where it's staying at, see the dirt, and it won't go in, and they'll be able to catch it very easily then. And so, rather than soil its white coat, the ermine is trapped by the dogs and captured all the while preserving its purity. You could almost say, for the ermine, purity is more important, more precious than its very life. And unfortunately, you can't say that for a lot of Christians. Unfortunately, for many who call themselves Christians, purity, holiness, is not so precious a commodity. As a matter of fact, as I said, in many Christian circles, the word holiness is not even spoken of at all. You don't even hear it spoken. Or if it is presented, the concept of holiness, it's just presented as my positional stance before God, not as an actual condition of my life. In other words, if they speak about holiness at all, they talk about it this way. Well, God sees me as holy because of my position in Christ, but I'm not actually 
actually holy. God sees me as holy, but I'm not actually living as a holy man or woman before God. And so that's the way holiness is presented, if it's presented at all, in most Christian circles. And so this idea of being holy, actually living a holy life, having an actual, real holiness, the kind of holiness Peter is speaking of here, because he's not talking here about a positional holiness, for he says, be holy in all you do. That's talking about your conduct. That's talking about how you live in your conversation, as the King James Version puts it. Be holy in how you live. And so this holiness of conduct, this holiness that Peter's speaking about here, to be a holy person in actual real life is viewed by many Christians as just being kind of unattainable. It's not realistic for this life. In his book, Unchristian, David Kinnaman discusses some very disheartening research concerning the failure of Christians in our day to be a distinct people of God. He writes, quote, In virtually every study we conduct, born-again Christians, not just those who say they're Christian because their granddaddy, you know, was a was an Episcopalian or something. These are people who claim to be born again. Born again Christians fail to display much attitudinal or behavioral evidence of transformed lives. For instance, based on a study released in 2007, we found that most of the lifestyle activities of born again Christians were statistically equivalent to those of non-born-again people. When asked to identify their activities over the last 30 days, born-again believers were just as likely to have visited a pornographic website, to take something that did not belong to them, to consult a medium or psychic, to physically fight or abuse someone, to have consumed enough alcohol to be considered legally drunk, to have used an illegal, non-prescription drug, to have said something to someone that was not true, to have gotten back at someone for something he or she did, and to have said mean things behind another person's back, end quote. He's saying in these studies, when Christians take them anonymously, of course, what is being shown is that they don't live any different than people who have no claim of salvation. That those who say they're born again statistically live just like the world does. And I read that and my heart breaks and I think to myself, is that the kind of life Jesus died to give us? Is that what Jesus meant when he declared whom the Son sets free is free indeed? Is, is that the picture of a Christ follower that the Word of God paints for us, that we're just like the world is, that I'm just like someone who's not saved, except I'm forgiven, that's the only difference. And I would answer to that, no, a thousand times no. Jesus Christ came to set us free from being a slave of sin. He came to make us a holy people unto God. That's what he wants us to be. That's what Jesus died to make us. Not just holy in our position before God, but so that we can have an actual, real holiness in our life. And yet most Christians, if they even think of conditional holiness at all, living a holy life, view it as just kind of unrealistic quaint concept of a bygone era related to the realm of monks and monasteries. Chuck Swindoll puts it this way. Holiness, he writes, sounds scary. It doesn't need to be, but to the average American it is. Our tendency is to say that holiness is something for the cloistered halls of a monastery. It needs organ music, long prayers, and religious sounding chants. It hardly seems appropriate for those in the real world of this century. It is almost as though holiness is a private way of life for a special group of monks, missionaries, and martyrs. 
But nothing could be further from the truth. And I would add to that other people view holiness as perhaps a strict, puritan, rigid conformity to rules and regulations. The kind of life which takes undue pride in dresses to the floor and collars to the neck and hair cut in certain ways. The kind of life which looks down in disdain and disgust at all who do not measure up to the outward standards it sets. And so people view holiness if they think about it all in that manner. Well, it's just for monks and missionaries and the spiritual elite. Or holiness is, is um, you know, Peter the prophet uh, sitting there with his, looking at his nose down at everyone. And he wears clothes a certain way. And he's real strict and rigid and everything. But in either case, for the vast majority of Christians, holiness, the idea of actually living holy is abandoned as not practical in a life filled with demanding jobs and screaming kids and bills due and temptations aplenty. And so holiness is a word, as I said, that's thrown by the wayside in our modern culture and in much of the modern church. But let me tell you something. God hasn't got rid of the concept. He hasn't thrown it away. Matter of fact, when you read his word, over 1,200 times holy and holiness are used in the Bible. Sometimes relating to God, sometimes relating to um, his works, sometimes relating to us. But it does let us know that holiness is vitally important. Holiness does matter. God expects his people to be holy. If I were to ask you the question, how many here today are Christians. Probably, just about every one of you would raise your hand. I'm a Christian. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. Well, let me tell you something. If that's your testimony, if that's who you are, God expects His people to be a holy people. To live out a holy life. That's his expectation, and that, as I said, is what Jesus died to make us. God expects it, but he also provides the way for us to be that way, and to live that way. Let me just give you some scriptures here real quick. 1 Peter 1.16, what we just read. Be holy, for I am holy. Ephesians 1, set up 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Just as he chose us, in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. Ephesians, or I mean Romans 1, 7, the Apostle Paul writes to the Romans in his greetings, to everyone in Rome, loved by God and called to be holy. Romans 6, 19, so now, Give them, he's talking about the members of our bodies, the different parts of our bodies. He tells us, give them as servants to righteousness to do what is holy. And lastly, James 3, 7. But the wisdom which is from heaven is first holy. God expects us and he provides for us to be a holy people unto him. Now, we can reject the notion that holiness is reserved for monasteries and Puritans. Holiness is for everybody who claims Christ as Savior. Amen. It's not just for an elect few. It's not just for uh, just a small segment of the Christian faith. <clears throat> We're just supposed to be like Jesus, right? Wasn't Jesus the most holy person who ever lived? He was without sin. And yet we don't see Jesus living out this holy life, moving to a monastery and chanting all the time, nor do we see Him looking down and disdain at those caught in the trap of sin. We see Him engaging in everyday life, relating to people, loving people, speaking the truth in love, living a holy life. That's who I am supposed to be like. That's whose character God's supposed to be developing in me. And so we're to be holy. So Christian, Christ follower, what is this holiness we're talking about? How does this look in our everyday, normal Christian life lived here in Mercer County or whatever county you're in? What does it mean to be holy? Well, that's, that's a big question. 
<laughs> I mean, literally, volumes and volumes have been written about that. Which we're not going to cover every aspect today, thank God. <laughs> but I do want to give you just the simple, what I think the simple overview of what it means to, to live in biblical holiness. And for me, it's summed up best by an old gospel song that some of you may recognize. It goes like this. Jesus on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. You ever hear that song? Jesus on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. For me, that describes what true biblical holiness is all about. So let's look at this. Let's see if we can understand this. Jesus on the inside. What does that mean to have Jesus on the inside? What's that about? First of all, let me say, that's the catalyst. Without that, you can't even... Hope to be holy before God. You would have to have Jesus on the inside. Without the presence of Christ, without the Spirit of Christ working and living in you, you cannot be holy. You can be religious without Jesus. You can do religious things without Jesus. You can come to church without Jesus. You can sing songs without Jesus. You can do religious activity without Jesus. You can be moral in certain aspects of your life without Jesus. You can be, even be, quote unquote, a good person. Someone that people like. Someone that people say is a good person without Jesus. But you cannot be holy before God without first having Jesus on the inside. Because whatever holiness we have before God, whatever true holiness we have, the source of that holiness has to be God Himself. He alone is truly holy. And all real holiness comes from Him. I've got to have Jesus on the inside of me. So two quick questions. First of all, how does Jesus get on the inside? What happens there? Well, we read in 1 Peter 1.3, and the, as he's talking here in the context of telling them to be holy, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. A lot said there that I don't have time to get into, but I want to focus on the word new birth. How do I get Jesus on the inside of me? By getting saved. Well, we talked about that first week. Through this new birth, being born again, that Jesus told Nicodemus we need to do to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus gets on the inside of you and me by us, first of all, receiving Christ as our Savior. As we looked at, our sins are forgiven, but more than that happens. We are also given a new heart, a new desires, new passions, new love, new priorities. God changes our nature. And then He comes to live inside of us by His Spirit. Ezekiel speaks of this in Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 when he's speaking prophetically of the new covenant which you and I now belong to. Moreover, God says, I will give you a new heart. This is what happens when Jesus comes on the inside. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone, the unredeemed heart, the heart that's cold, the heart that loves sin, the heart that's on evil and continually. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. A new heart that desires the things of God. A new heart that loves the Lord. A new heart that wants to please God. And I will put my spirit within you. Did you catch that? That's Jesus on the inside. I will put my spirit on the inside of you, within you. And the end result of all that is a holy life. And cause you to walk. That means how you live your life. Walk in my statutes. 
What a great, great promise God gave to Ezekiel and to the nation of Israel. And he fulfilled when Christ died on the cross and began this new covenant. I will put my spirit, Jesus, on the inside in you and cause you to walk in my statue, working on the outside. So when I, by faith, believe on Jesus Christ for my salvation, Jesus comes and lives inside me through the person of the Holy Spirit. And unless you have experienced that salvation, you cannot be holy. So that's one thing, getting Jesus on the inside. But most of us are probably there. Most of us could say, yes, I have received Christ as my Savior. I am born again. So the next question on this Jesus on the inside thing is, He may be on the inside of you, He may be in your heart, and praise God for that, but is He on the throne of your life? You see, there's a big difference between being a resident and being an owner. When I lived uh, in Columbus there for a few years, I still worked in Greenville, most of you know the story by now, and uh, I, that's about a two hour drive I would have one way. And so my parents let me set up a little room in their farmhouse, and uh, I could stay there whenever I wanted to, whenever maybe I had to work over and it didn't make sense to drive, have four hours driving to you know, sleep for three hours. That sort of thing. And so sometimes I would stay at my parents' house. I had my own little room there. They were very gracious in allowing me to do that. My castle, your castle type thing. Um, but the reality was I wasn't the owner of that home. I was a guest. And so I couldn't just go there in the living room and say, you know, I don't like the couch here. I think I'm going to move it here. And I don't like this table. It's too crowded here. I'm going to get rid of that. And I don't like the way this room's painted, so I'm going to paint it a different color. I couldn't do that. I could ask to have it done or ask if I could, but I couldn't just go make changes because I'm not the owner. But God has blessed Stretch and I now with the house in which we are the owners. Our name is on the deed. And so guess what? We want to paint a bedroom. I don't have to ask anyone's permission. I just go paint it. We want to put a new door on the side as we did. We just did it. Thank you, Vic, for helping me. <laughs> well, actually, he did it. I helped him. <laughs> we want to do that. We did it. I want to cut a tree down. I'll cut a tree down. I can do it because I'm the owner. I don't have to ask permission. Well, Jesus comes on the inside of us when we're saved, and he takes residence in us. But what we soon find out is He's not on the throne of everything. He's not controlling everything. And there's parts of our life in which we still want to control. We still want to do what we want to do. And so what He asks us to do as Christians is come to the point of full surrender. In which we say, Lord, You're in me. Now I want You to be Lord of all. And I make the conscious decision to consecrate every part of my life. Lay it all upon your altar. Hands off. And now you're no longer just a resident, but you are on the throne of every part of my life. And we reach that place of full surrender. Paul speaks of this in Romans 12.1. When he tells these Roman Christians, Therefore I urge you, brothers, this is important, this isn't some little sideline. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, God has done all this for you. He's saved you. He sent His Son. He's called you. He's done all of this for you. In view of God's mercy, here's what our response must be as Christians. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual act of worship. Once again, don't have time to break all that down, but what I want to bring out is Jesus on the inside. Okay, you're a Christian. Is He Lord of all? Is He just a resident? Or is He King? Everybody who truly born again, God brings to that point in which we need to realize we've got to make Him Lord of it all. Have you done that? Jesus on the inside. This is how we're holy before God. We fully surrender to Him. We ask Him as our Savior. We fully surrender 
to Him. He does the work in us. Jesus on the inside, ruling, reigning on the throne and in control. And what happens then? He works on the outside, on how we live, our conduct, our walk. Stories told of a rather pompous looking deacon who was endeavoring to impress upon his class of boys the importance of living the Christian life, not just saying you're Christian, but living it. And so he asked him rather sternly, Why do you think people call me a Christian? And after a moment's pause, one youngster stood up and said, Well, maybe it's because they don't know you. Well, that's a good question, though. Why do people call you a Christian? Why should they call us Christians? Just because we say we are? Why would people call us Christ followers? It's not just because of our, direct, our correct doctrine, although correct doctrine is vitally important. You've got to believe the right stuff. But that's not why people are going to call us Christian. Not because we go to church. A lot of people go to church. Doesn't necessarily mean we're a Christian. We're living it. Not because we even talk about prayer or faith. You see a lot of that on Facebook. And then their next post is something terrible. We will be called Christian. Christ followers. Because the world will see us being like Jesus. Being like, loving like Jesus loves. Acting like Jesus acts. Talking like Jesus would talk. Hating what Jesus hates. Serving as Jesus serves. Sacrificing as Jesus did. You see, Jesus on the inside, but He's working on the outside. That's biblical holiness. And so God is developing the character of Jesus in me, and it, the result is people will see me living like, acting like, loving like, serving like, sacrificing like Jesus. And it's not because I'm gritting my teeth, forcing myself to do so. But because Jesus is on the inside. And when Jesus is ruling and reigning in here, it cannot help but change the outside. The Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Just very quickly, let's break this down. I'm talking to Christians here. Here's how we're to be developing. We with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. That's biblical holiness. It's not in me. It's not me trying to be good. I'm reflecting God's glory. I'm reflecting His character. And we are being transformed. Notice it's passive there in a sense. I'm not transforming myself. But I am being transformed. How does that happen? Jesus on the inside. Jesus on the throne of my heart. Me being surrendered and letting Him work. When I'm doing that, then God's doing His part. He is transforming me into what? Not into the incredible Hulk. <clears throat> But I'm being transformed into His likeness. The likeness of Jesus. Not all at once, but with ever-increasing glory. And all of this comes from the Lord through His Spirit. This is the working on the outside. Sometimes... God brings us suddenly through something, maybe a deliverance from a habit that was ungodly. Oftentimes, it's more gradual, just a slow change over time, but it's always progressive, ever-increasing glory. 
use myself as an example here. When I was 19, 20 years old, I had a terrible temper. I would just blow off about anything. I don't have that terrible temper anymore. Now I'm 51. Now I still get mad sometimes because anger is an emotion and you do get mad sometimes from time to time. But that flying off the handle, that irrational rage, I no longer deal with that. Why? It's not because I learned to overcome it by gritting my teeth, as I said, and trying really hard and doing it. No, I overcame it because Jesus was on the inside. And over time, he's worked on the outside. And over time, with ever-increasing glory, I'm representing more of his likeness and less of what I used to be like. And I'm just using that as an example. You can fill in the blank. I'm more like Jesus today than I was when I was 20 years old. And that's no bragging on me. That's bragging on Jesus. Because believe me, he had a lunkhead to work with. All I did was have sense enough to stay surrendered to him. And if I messed up, repent, and turn back and say, Lord, here I am again. Here I am again. I messed up again, but here I am again if you'll have me. And over time, with ever-increasing glory, I'm more and more, my life is reflecting who Jesus is. That's Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. That's the process of becoming like Christ. That's the process of God making you holy as He is holy, with an actual real holiness of doing life. Not just some positional holiness, as important that is before God, but actually being able to be holy. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. And last line, oh, what a change in my life. And that's the result. Change. Change. Think about it. You are not who you once were. Aren't you grateful for that? You are not who you once were. You don't go where you used to go. You don't talk the way you used to talk. You don't feel the way you used to feel. You're not bound by the things that used to bind you. You're not in that mat, muck and mire of sin that you were once in. But Christ has changed you. Oh, what a change in my life. Sin does not dominate you anymore. Christ does. Life is no longer lived unto ourselves, but in service to the king. The world and all its glitter and gold has lost its sheen and an appeal, and our meat now, our substance, is to do the will of the Father. And all of that brings us satisfaction. All of us, that brings us strength for what we're facing. And all of that prepares us for an eternity in heaven with Him. Changed by the power of God into His likeness to reflect His glory, to have His mindset to be a holy people unto God. That's biblical holiness. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. I don't know. You don't seem too excited about what God's doing in your life. What a change in my life. I'm not who I once was. I'm not headed where I once was headed. But God in His patience and love is making me more like the Savior than I love dearly. More like Jesus. Amen. Now it's not that I'm perfect in this and you've found that out already. <laughs> but here's the thing. We're not perfect but we're being perfected. It's a big difference just kind of shrugging your shoulder. Oh, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. No, as Christians, we're not perfect. God knows we're not. But we're being perfected by Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. So my part in all this is to let Jesus keep working. Stay surrendered, stay submitted, 
As I said, as I mess up, get on my knees and ask for forgiveness and move on with Him. But over time, God will do the work and make me more like Him. Let me end with this. Why does God care if we're holy or not? What's the big deal about holiness? Can He just save us and say, I'll see you in heaven? Why does God want us to be holy? Two quick reasons. Holiness is freedom. You see, it's not a bad thing to be holy. As a matter of fact, it's what you were created to be. And as we looked at when we looked at sin, when we're living a life of sin and bondage, it brings pain and sorrow and heartache and regret because we were never meant to live that way. On the flip side of that, positively, we were created to live holy lives. And we are at our freest. We are at our most content, at our most joyful state when we are able to live life the way God created us to live it, as a holy people unto Him. There is freedom, as the old hymn puts it, glorious freedom in being holy before God. That's why God cares. He loves you. And He wants you to free from all that saddens your life, all that destroys your body, all that messes with your mind. He wants to make you free from all of that. And so freedom and holiness is freedom. And then holiness makes us useful for God's work. We're here to do His bidding. John R. W. Stott, I love this quote. Remember, you are God's sword. His instrument, as we read earlier in Romans, instruments of righteousness. His instrument. I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. I love that line. I'm not very tired. I don't know what I can do. You can be like Jesus. You can let God do this work in you. It is not great talent God so much blesses as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister, and I would add layman, is an awful weapon in the hands of God. Why does God care about holiness? Holiness makes us useful to Him. So that we can reach more people for Jesus Christ. And that is what is that is the heartbeat of God. So it's not just some personal piety. It's, it's what equips you to live a free life. It equips you to be used of God to reach the people around you that need Jesus. Holiness. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Let me ask you, is that truly your testimony today? If it is, praise God and just have sense enough to keep on the altar. Someone once said, the thing about a living sacrifice is it can crawl off. Keep that living sacrifice on the altar. If it's not, it can be. And all you need to do, if you've messed up in this, is say, Lord, here I am. Forgive me. I place myself under your Lordship again. Keep patiently working in me. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. I want us to be a holy people of God, a powerful weapon in this hand. How about you? Dear Heavenly Father,